All right, let's get back to a topic we've discussed on several other videos, um, is the topic of span of control, or span of command and control, which is the SOCC, it can be called that as well, but um, more commonly just called span of control. We discuss this in terms of structure, um, why are military units structured the way they are, and we've also discussed this in videos about, uh, you know, what's the optimal squad size, okay? I'll try to put links somewhere around here. Uh, but I want to come back to this because it's a very important leadership consideration. You have what's known as arousal, um, arousal levels in sports psychology and educational psychology. I wish they would have uh, just called this awareness levels, but it is factually called an arousal level. And, and you know what this is. This is in military and law enforcement um, circles. This is also referred to by other names called auditory or visual exclusion. And that's part of the arousal levels. What it means is this, when you first come into a situation, particularly a life-threatening situation, but it can even be as much as a game, your initial um, position is to go, what's going on? And so I'm gonna show with my hands, and it's just illustrative, it doesn't mean anything, but you really are trying to go, okay, oh, what's my left limit? What's my right limit? Who's who in the zoo? How's this played? What's going on here? right? And so you have a very broad um, uh, arousal level. And then as you start to understand, oh, I see what's going on, and you de then say, oh my gosh, I need to pay attention here and, and focus and make a decision. You, this is also called your OODA loop, right? Your uh, observe, then we orientate, then we decide and act. We've even discussed this in the Rubicon Theory video um, about making decisions and the risks that come with that arousal level. This is part of the OODA loop. It, it's, that's part of arousal levels. And again, when I focus in on something and when I decide and then I act, I have to be laser-like focus. If you think of uh, sports, something like basketball or, or really any of them, football, particularly contact sports, um, you know, martial arts and stuff like that, you have to commit to a decisive act. And when you do, you often get a visual uh, exclusion on the action you are taking. You may even get auditory exclusion on the action you're taking. Inside of police circles, this is known as, you know, target exclusion. Um, it may be auditory exclusion where you can hear the incoming fire, but it's only your fire, outgoing fire that's loud or vice versa. And you exclude things. Your, your mind will start to exclude things that are actually happening and playing out in front of you. We've seen this through simulation or actual events that are caught on video and the people involved will say didn't even see that didn't even see the clown walking with the baby carriage between me and this you know the suspect who was shooting back at me in the simulation again auditory exclusion visual exclusion the OODA loop um, all of these things are elements of arousal states your ability to gain situational awareness and then the narrowing of that situational awareness so that you can come to a decision and go right into decisive action. So you're going, oh, okay, all right, got it. That's the arousal. Well, the arousal um, states are related, and not just tangentially, to the span of command and control, or a also, again, called the leader's span of control. And so I've talked about this on several different uh, videos, but again, it's such a critical leadership phenomenon. And if you don't think so, then here's some odd sort of anecdotal evidence for you that when they look at commercial airlines, and not just commercial airlines, but private airlines, and they crash, and then you have some investigative agency that walks in and says, well, why did they crash? And it is rather shocking how often the aircraft crashes into the earth because no one's flying the plane. So there's a problem. There's a problem with a light. In one case, a problem with a light over a wheel actually brought down a commercial airline, killed everybody on board. Whether it's a problem with speeds or wheels or lights or other gauges or there's a fire in one engine, everybody starts focusing on that. Again, their arousal 
levels narrow. They fail to see uh, f continue gaining situational awareness for the bigger picture, and they fail to fly the plane and they crash into the earth. And you say, well, how's that part of span of control? Again, how many problems can you as a leader solve in austere conditions? I'm not talking about how many people can you delegate, you know, some responsibility or some authority to uh, while you're sipping a Mai Tai, you know, at the beach going, yeah, man, it's all cool. You do you, bro. Hey, no stress. You can, the, the span of control uh, argument isn't invalid. It's not invalid at all. But if there's no stress and the whole situation is changed and we're not in an austere environment that, you know, needs real quick decisions and life and death and limb are at stake, then maybe this isn't as true, still true, but maybe it's not as true and maybe it's not as critical as the military seems to think it is. After all, a span of con command and control is really, you know, a concept that is maximized by the military, initiated and maximized by the military. Here I am saying it's critical. Well, it's critical to force structure. It's critical to how you go about doing your business. It criti you know, as a leader, are you going to be delegative, participative? Are you going to be authoritative? Well, that depends. Inside of austere, time pressure, high stake decisions, um, we very much tend to lean towards authoritative leadership. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's, it's actually a combination of both. It can be very healthy and have wonderful outcomes. But it also gets right to the heart of the matter. How many people can you pay attention to when lives are at stake and time is of the essence? There's lots of theories about this. I remember, again, um, going back to the 1980s with Lee Iacocca taking over Chrysler. And, you know, one of the things said about Lee Iacocca is that he could something like, I think it was seven or nine people, like subordinates, he could control at any given time. And being that he was the CEO, he really didn't answer to much other people other than, I'm sure, his family and God. But the point is that um, he was also a genius that had 40 years of experience under his belt. Most leaders do not have 40 years of experience under the belt, 40 plus years. If they do, they're at the very, very end of their career, the last days of their career. So, Let's go back to that 20-year-old corporal or that 24-year-old lieutenant. They're not at the end of their career, and they haven't had the benefit of 40 years of experience. And they're probably, though intelligent and capable, they're probably not geniuses. So you take out those factors and you say, fine. Now also realize that while Lee Iacocca uh, certainly perceived himself to be under time pressure, you want to get products out to a market, and that's fair. I'm not taking that away from him. But even he would agree, yeah, life and limb wasn't at stake. But for that 20-year-old corporal and that 24-year-old lieutenant in battle, life and limb is at stake. Keeping all of those factors in, here is what, uh, to the best of our knowledge, after much testing and, you know, um, the cognitive tests that went on in the 1950s that were disproven by the 1970s, and then they started in the 80s and 90s, um, what was the span of control under time pressured life and limb situations, again, austere environments? And the answer is five, but it's not quite that simple, is it? It's five total because the lieutenant, 24-year-old lieutenant, is not a general, and the 20-year-old corporal is also not a general, or the president of the United States, I should say. They have this long hierarchy of chain of command that they have to report up to. So you always have to report up one. You're saying even when bullets are flying? Yes, particularly when bullets are flying. Now, often what that initial communique sounds like is simply this. You, this is me, I'm in contact, out. I'm in contact. I'm fighting the fight in front of me, out. I'm not going to talk to you until I've gotten better situational awareness and solved the immediate problems. Once that's done, I'll call you right back. So, sure, the initial communication is often just, you, this is me, Bravo 26, this is India 38, in contact, out. And that just told your bosses, oh, 
sitting way back in a battalion talk somewhere, whoa, that element is in contact with an enemy force. Let's pay attention. And so this is why it's so critical that you do let them know, this is where I am, this is what I'm doing, right? And you've already said that, boom. Now, that's one. Now, you also have self-preservation, because if you don't, you're an idiot and you'll soon be dead. We'll be alleviated of our town idiot. So you have to have some self-preservation. When I talk about threat awareness and your arousal levels, this means don't step on a landmine and don't get shot in the face or bayoneted in the neck. You have to have self-preservation. I got to take care of me. That's two. One up, me. I've already used two of the five that I can gain a situational, aware for, uh, a situational awareness for and direct. I can direct myself and I can inform my boss. This means I can control three subordinates in an austere condition. One up, myself, three down. While a corporal is often, often, not always, but often controlling three privates, of a crew or a fire team or something like this, and sometimes more because corporals can be real quick, uh, they can find themselves becoming a squad leader very quickly. But nonetheless, what we expect of uh, a corporal is that he's controlling three. And then the squad leader is a sergeant, and so um, what will that squad leader control? Will they control all of the soldiers in their squad? No, they can only control the three fire team leaders. They talk to their platoon leader as a squad leader. They take care of themselves, that's two, and they talk to the three fire team leaders. They direct the three fire team leaders and no one else. If they start to direct other people, the plane crashes. They stop paying attention to themselves. No one's flying the plane anymore. The lieutenant, likewise, a clever lieutenant knows I talk to my company commander, my captain, and I direct three squad leaders. I do not direct their fire team leaders and I do not direct their jundies, their warriors. I control the actions of my three squad leaders. I make sure I don't inadvertently get a bayonet in the neck and I report up to my captain. Once again, one up, myself, three down. And this nests. It nests beautifully from the fire, well, the company commander, three platoons, one, two, three. From the platoon leader, three squads, one, two, three. From the squad leader, three fire teams, one, two, three. This is why units are structured the way they are in the military. You say, well, there's, there's variations of that, and there certainly are. Yet the normative behavior, the normative structure, are in series of threes. And now you know why. It's because of the phenomenon known as span of command and control, that we must be able to protect ourselves, inform our boss, and directly guide the actions and behaviors of three subordinates when in austere environments that are time pressured and high stake. That's where we are. Keep that in mind. Use that. Um, that's a very, very clever thing to do. But use that when you're thinking of your plan. When you're coming to your planning, we say, yeah, you plan two up, you plan two down. You plan. You don't control. That is, the platoon nests its mission within the company's mission and within the battalion's mission. That's planning two up. I'm watching, okay, this is a battalion's mission. This is my company's part of that mission. This is my platoon's part of my company's mission. And that platoon leader is saying, I'm going to maneuver my squad leaders and I want to plan for their fire teams. So you plan up to, you plan down to, but you control five. That's the span of control. And that's why. Thank you.